Unclean! Unclean! Make way! Stand aside! Unclean! Let me pass! Unclean! 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 This is how a leper had to make his way through life. That word unclean once controlled my every thought, but now it no longer describes me in any way. It's probably hard for you as the average person to understand the feeling that comes upon a man when holy people call them unclean before Yahweh. That once was me. Simon the leper. This is my story, how I became clean, and how I was changed by Jesus, the Messiah. I was born in Bethany, in the countryside just a few miles from the city of Jerusalem. The lovely, quiet little village provided a restful place in comparison to the hustle and bustle of the capital city. But more than that, Bethany would be the backdrop for the most significant moments of my life. My father had been what is called in the Hebrew language a rekah. It is a perfumer or apothecary. For generations, our family had practiced the fine art of making incense and perfume and oils and ointment. Because it was a specialized skill, it brought great wealth to our family. I was an only child, so I grew up in the industry, and I learned every aspect of the trade. So when my parents passed away, I inherited the family business. My partner in business was my lovely wife, Abigail, as well as my partner in life. She was a beautiful girl that came from the town of Bethlehem. Before the sadness of their passing, both of our parents had arranged for our betrothal while we were still very young. When I turned 16, I was informed of the arrangement, and I was anxious about meeting Abigail for the very first time. Our introduction was rather awkward at first, but I began to relax because Abigail did most of the speaking. That meant that I did most of the listening. When both parties are in agreement about such a division of communication, it can lead to quite a happy marriage. Most of the men I know perhaps could agree, and some women as well, in my case, I had little choice. During our courtship, I gave Abigail a nickname, the nickname Shanik. In the Hebrew language, Shanik means to prattle on endlessly, and she lived up to that expectation. In the beginning, I considered it rather enchanting, but after the first few months of marriage, I must admit it became quite a burden. <laughs> Have you ever seen a donkey walk about with its head and ears hanging low? I can guarantee Shanique has been talking to him. <laughs> well, despite uh, her gift for chatter, I loved my Abigail deeply. And together, Abigail and I loved children. It was our plan to have a child as soon as possible after our wedding. So after a couple of years, we were blessed and enjoyed two beautiful little girls. The first was named Martha, the oldest, and her younger sister was named Mary. I cherished both of my girls, but I will tell you that Mary was my favorite. You see, Martha had inherited her mother's passion for oration, and she had quite a powerful spirit and personality. On the other hand, Mary uh, was quiet and tender and possessed an enchanting smile. We were a blessed and happy family. 
The love that we shared was the anchor of our lives. We worked together and we played together and we followed the teachings of Yahweh together. His blessing upon our business brought us great status and recognition in the community. There were many times that we were asked by the community to sing the songs of joy and praise in the synagogue meetings or at celebrations in the neighborhood. It was not unusual for there to be times when we would overhear people say, here comes happy Simon and his lovely family. And we cherished those moments. Because sadly, the joy was not to last. Our lives would be known more for loss than for happiness. After the girls grew to be little ladies, Abigail became with child again. She and I secretly prayed that Yahweh would bless us with a son. The delivery was difficult for her. And both she and our son developed a severe fever. The midwives did the best they could. But when my son Lazarus was born, it cost the life of his mother. My dear Abigail was gone. The boy Lazarus survived, but the fever left him with a lingering cough. You see, Life had been wonderful, and my crashing to reality was extreme for me. Oh, how I missed my wife, my partner, my Shamik, and now I long to hear her speak just one more word. Life went on, but there were times when I could hardly breathe. I tried to describe the broken heart barely beating in my chest, and all I could muster was to say, there is no longer a song in my heart. My mourning lasted for several weeks. My friends were worried about me. Later they told me I would not even acknowledge Lazarus and refused to hold him in my arms. And apparently I hardly even noticed when the girls tried to kiss me on the cheek. The reality that I was now a single father raising three children was overwhelming. I was a broken and lonely man. I screamed at heaven in agony and despair. What am I supposed to do? But the heavens were silent. I was filled with anger against Yahweh for what he had done to us. And I must admit to you, if it was not for those two little girls and my baby boy, my life would have ended by my own hand. But days went on. And one morning I awoke. After a night of battling for just a little bit of sleep. But I awoke to face the reality of the new life God had handed me. I must live. I must go on. I realized that. Or I would die. Fortunately, as months turned into years, we began to heal a little bit as a family. And the loss and the pain subsided. 
And as we pulled together, the girls and boy going close together and holding tightly to me and to each other, we slowly became a family again. I wish I could tell you that everything changed, but the sadness is this, that the passing of Abigail was just the beginning of our sorrows. You may not be aware of it, but the Romans occupied Israel during that time. And it became increasingly harder for me just to send the servants to Egypt to get the supplies for our business. It was apparent that I would have to make the journey myself to Egypt to buy the plants and the flowers and the herbs that we would need for our perfumes. The children were older now and could take care of themselves with the help of a few close friends. So I made the journey that took several weeks, and it, the time passed rather quickly. And I came back to Bethany, back with my children, together again. You would think that life should be beautiful, but instead, within a few days, I became very sick. I was bedridden. With the help of neighbors, Martha and Mary tried to nurse me back to health. None of the other servants or travelers on the journey showed any signs of sickness, no symptoms whatsoever, and we were quite baffled by that. So we sent for a priest. The priest acted as the doctors that we would have in Israel during that day. And the priests were pretty convinced that something along the route from Egypt to Bethany had brought on my sickness, but they felt like there was nothing they could do about it. And then Lazarus became sick as well. The servants cleaned the house from top to bottom, but he got worse and worse. And it wasn't until we gathered together with others and we spent several hours praying to Yahweh for his healing that we began to see a sign of restoration in him, now a young man. He eventually became well, and yet the sickness left him frail and weak for all of his life. My illness was something quite different. Martha took charge of the house, and Mary took care of me, and I was not getting any better. We called for the priest again, and when they came, they diagnosed me as having a serious skin disease. Evidently, there was an infection that had settled in my body and caused me a severe rash that itched and burned terribly. The priest was adamant that I present myself in the temple to the high priest for a diagnosis. And I thought to myself before Yahweh, how much more can a man endure? And when I presented myself to the high priest, the terrible words I heard from his mouth was that I was unclean. Every skin disease in Israel during that day was called by the same word, leprosy. So I began to pray to Yahweh that I would not have the severest type that would deform my face and hands and feet. I would have to live in isolation, hoping for the rest of my life that perhaps I might be healed. I wasn't sure how much more I could take. The loss of my Abigail was still lingering in my heart. And then I was pulled from my family 
and told that I would have to live with strangers who were also diseased and ridiculed. I can tell you that anyone who once thought I was Happy Simon knew that things were changed now, for the perfumer had now become the leper. And I cried out to Yahweh, what, what have I done that you hate me so? I try to explain, but I know it's hard for you to understand. You see, I had to live with a gang of outcasts. We lived under the trees and in the caves around the Mount of Olives. Like the others, I was not allowed to enter village or town. I was not supposed to be around people. What little food or clean clothing I received was placed by my children underneath a designated tree for me to find. They took care of me, even though I was now an exile in my own homeland. As the years passed, I grew bitter, more angry, lonely, feeling loss and pain. But then one day, when I went to the tree, I found the meal brought to me by Lazarus. And with the meal, there was a note. A note that came from Mary and Martha that said that they had heard of a rabbi who had a reputation for healing. He was coming to the small towns in the area and would come to Bethany on a particular day. It meant that I would have to risk being stoned by the townsfolk. But if I could endure that, I might meet him and perhaps he could help me. So early on that appointed day, I escaped from the leper colony and made my way to the outskirts of Bethany. I hid among the shrubs for what seemed like an eternity. And then I heard a commotion. I dared peek out and there I saw the rabbi that we had waited for. It was a man named Jesus of Nazareth. Others were going to him for healing and I pleaded with Yahweh that this might be my opportunity. And suddenly, without thinking, I bolted from the bushes and I ran to Jesus and I fell at his feet. And I blurted out, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then there was silence. And then I felt something I had not felt in years. The touch of a hand upon my head. No one was supposed to touch a leper, but Jesus did. And then I heard his words. I am willing. Be made clean. And instantly I felt the itching and the burning stop. I gathered my courage and looked at my arms and hands and the redness and the rash were gone. I stood up to shout to the world and Jesus said, no, tell no one. But go to the priest and offer the sacrifice prescribed by Moses for a testimony of your healing. I had not walked very fast in a long time, but that day I walked as fast as I could. I moved as quickly as I could to get to the temple. And all along the way, I suddenly felt something causing me to fly, and I moved quickly. And when I got to the temple and saw the priest, I realized that Lazarus and Mary and Martha had come alongside of me and picked me up and carried me most of the way. And when I stood before the priest and he examined my body, it was such a blessing to hear the words. Son, you are clean. A joy washed over me. I had been healed by the master. 
And from that day on, our lives began to change. You see, for one thing, we began to follow after Jesus. We sought after him and we listened to whenever he would speak. He was amazing that his words restored our heart and changed our thinking. So much so that on one particular day, we met privately with Jesus. In speaking to him, he revealed to us that we had been too concerned about our own personal happiness and wallowing in our family sorrow. We begged him for forgiveness and asked Jesus to cleanse us from all of that. We also made a decision that from that day on, we would financially support the work of Jesus. Even more than that, we allowed Jesus to come to our home for rest whenever he was near Bethany. He became a close friend, especially with Lazarus. And when the disciples were present with us, they would tell us the stories of Jesus' miracles. They told us how the blind were made to see and the lame could walk again and how Jesus fed thousands of people with a little boy's lunch. And by his hand, the waves and the winds were calmed on the Sea of Galilee. More than the miracles, it dawned upon us and we had no doubt that Jesus was the Messiah that Israel had long waited for. But I will tell you the deepest experience that our family had with Jesus was when Lazarus became ill again. We sent for Jesus because we needed his help, but he was prevented from arriving until Lazarus had already died. My son was in the tomb buried for four days before Jesus appeared. We even had the mourners still with us, weeping and wailing and shouting. Jesus seemed to be rather disturbed by their presence, but even more so by the lack of faith in Mary and Martha. They began to think, and it showed in their faces, he who healed others could not save the one he loved their brothers. You see, it is often easier to believe that Yahweh can provide power for others than it is to think that he can work in our lives and the lives of those we love. But Jesus completely surprised us. The master spoke three words and turned our world upside down again. He went out to the tomb where Lazarus was buried. And Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come forth. I stood there and watched how Lazarus made his way out of the tomb, still draped in his burial cloths. And that was the moment that Jesus changed me. Oh, I, I believed he was the Messiah, but now I believed he was my Lord. And I placed my faith in him. I believed in him. I committed my life to him. And it was amazing that the very restoration of Lazarus was the one thing that seemed to bring about the plan for Jesus' death. In a few days, Jesus boldly entered the city of Jerusalem to preach and to confront the religious leaders. At night, we welcomed him back into our home for rest and renewal. And on one evening, we held a dinner party in his honor. Martha was delivering the meal and overseeing the servants. 
Lazarus was reclining at the table with Jesus. And then Mary entered the parlor carrying a beautiful jar of expensive perfume from our apothecary. Almost unnoticed by anyone there, she moved to the head of Jesus and broke the seal of that jar. She anointed his head and she anointed his feet and then she fell before him and wiped his feet with her long flowing hair. It was a demonstration of love. Oh, but hers was not some tawdry expression of romance. It was a demonstration of devotion by a disciple who was filled with love for the master. And soon no one could not notice for the room was filled with the fragrance of that expensive perfume. All was not glorious. Some of the disciples were dismayed that she wasted the perfume that could have been sold. But Jesus calmed them, declared that her act of love was a sign for his impending death and burial. The relationship that Mary had with Jesus was amazing. She knew his heart better than anyone. Others could not see even days into the future, but Mary seemed to be able to. And it was important to her that that one who loved others unconditionally and sacrificially would be prepared for what he was about to face in Jerusalem on Passover. In just a few hours, it seemed, all that we dreaded came to pass. Jesus was arrested and went through a mock trial with a fake court, but they sentenced him to die on a criminal's cross. It was horrible to see how his life could be snuffed out because of hate and envy. But as I stood there watching, I finally understood. By his death, he gave me life. He had healed me of my leprosy. And by faith now he had healed me of my unclean heart. You see, I no longer had to shout unclean. No, I use the bells for much different use. Now I shook them and I said, clean, clean. I stand before the creator of the universe. Jesus shed blood, washed my sinful heart. And in place of my sorrow, he restored my song. Clean before the Lord I stand, and in me not one blemish does he see. When I placed all my burdens on him. He washed them all from me. When I placed all my burdens on him, he washed, he washed. He washed them all from me. He washed them all from me. Maybe that's you today. 
Maybe you feel unclean. Something in your life. Been far from God. But Jesus can make you clean. We want to give you an opportunity to do that. To come be washed in the blood of Jesus.